All right, good morning. Glad to have everyone here. Looks like we're down a little bit because of the weather, I assume. A lot of people are out of town as well. So uh, glad to have you here. And if you all stand up, we're going to sing one verse of Behold the Lamb. So we'll go ahead and start with that. Behold the Lamb, behold the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, for sinners crucified, O holy sacrifice. morning and that's our purpose is to behold the lamb the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world I'm glad you're here this morning and uh, one day winter is going to end it may not be anytime soon but one day it will so I'm grateful for everyone who's here I'm sure Paul will make mention of it really appreciate all the men who came out Friday and Saturday to work on the water line got a lot of work done and uh, really appreciate those men who came out and did that work well, let's go ahead and look at our verse of the week this morning on the screen or there in your bulletin. And it has nothing to do with the message this morning. I was just reading this week in Isaiah, and I saw this verse, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a really wonderful verse. So let's say it together, and we'll begin. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number, he calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. You have a great God. You have a great God. And we're here to worship him today. And I trust everything that is sung, every moment of fellowship, your opportunity to worship through giving, your opportunity to worship in his word will be to bring praise and honor to him. Well, I'm going to invite our men to come forward this morning for prayer time. I have no special requests other than let's just ask God to really do a, a good work in our hearts today that God would minister to each of us. I'm going to ask my son if he would just lead us in prayer as we go for the Lord. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the day. Thank you for allowing us to be here in your house this morning and just giving us the privilege and uh, honor of worshiping you and just pray that everything that's said and done in this place today in your house would be honoring and glorifying to you first and that it would be uplifting to those that are uh, saved and that are on their way to heaven uh, and I, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know you as their savior that uh, first of all that that would be taken care of today that they would understand their need for you that you would prick their heart uh, with your word and that you just do a special work in them to make them realize their need for you and that they would accept you as their savior today and just pray that if there's anyone here that has a special need that hasn't been communicated that uh, you would take care of that need you know uh, you know all and uh, you know each need and each uh, each problem that goes on uh, in all of our lives and you know uh, exactly what to do to help us with that and uh, just what how to get things accomplished in our lives uh, for your glory I just pray that you do that and just think of uh, those that are sick those that are out um, and not able to be here today I pray you be with them that you just do a special work uh, just thank you for 
uh, just the answered prayers this week, just for the, the men coming out and just uh, getting this water line put in and just uh, the, the good help that was. And I uh, just pray that um, you just help us to use that building for your honor and glory, that you just do a special work, give us wisdom. I pray you be with the, the, the meeting tonight for the deacons and trustees, you give us wisdom in the decisions that are made and just the discussion that takes place, that you just, uh, just get glory and honor out of that as well. And just thank you for what you're going to do today. Just give everyone safety in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as you return to your seats, we're going to sing another song, and it'll be up on the screen. And it's Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, and we'll sing all the verses. Guide me, O Thou Great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. seated. If you are happy to be here, let's get one hand up in the air. We're going to keep it up in the air. If you're happy the person beside you, behind you, or in front of you is here, we get the other hand up in the air. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people said, praise the Lord. Uh, just uh, several things this morning. First of all, just a big thank you for all the men that came out and worked on the water line to the Family Life Center. And, you know, we had some bad weather, but we had some good fellowship. It was a great time, and and the old the old saying is, if the Lord doesn't find you handsome, He should at least find you handy. We had a whole bunch of handy men that worked the last couple days on that, so praise the Lord for them. Uh, five o'clock this evening, we do have our Bible study hour. Uh, after that, we have a deacons and trustees meeting, so deacons and trustees, please be prepared for that. Uh, Wednesday, March the thirtieth, that's the Awana Grand Prix. It's at six or six forty-five. Uh, at 7 o'clock, we do have our adults and teen service. Now, next Saturday, that's April the 2nd, that's our men's prayer meeting. We're going to be here at the church back in the Nicely Room at 9 o'clock in the morning. And what we do is we pray. So that's 9 o'clock next Saturday morning. Now, the next day, April the 3rd, we're going to have Bruce Burkholder here. If any of you remember Bruce Burkholder, first full-time youth pastor that we had here at Grace Baptist Church, phenomenal individual, a missionary. He did just about everything that you can do in the service of our Lord. So just a great man, and just just come out and hear this, this godly man speak. Now, April the 17th, that's our Resurrection Sunday. We're going to be having a special morning service at 7 o'clock here at the church. Following that, we're going to have breakfast. Then at 10 o'clock, we're going to have our morning worship there will be no Bible study hour at 5 o'clock. That's April 17th. Please make a note of that. Also, downstairs, there's a bin. Uh, Rock of Ages is collecting batteries, like old worn-out batteries, and turning them in to Bibles. 
So they're taking something, they're taking dead batteries and making, turning them to the living word for prisoners in their ministry. So if you have any dead batteries, please put them in the bin downstairs by the, the rear foyer and it'll be a, a blessing to those that receive the living word because of that. Uh, the last thing that I have, this is kind of like some of, some of the things that I think about and some of the things uh, I call it, instead of philosophy, it's philosophy. That's a play on words. Okay, one person got it. Thank you for that, Daisy. Okay. You know you're going through your second childhood when you can't open one of those childproof bottles. And if Listerine kills 99.97% of germs and bacteria, why can't you take a mouthful right out of the bottle? Because it should be self-sanitizing. Instead of calling them conspiracy theories, we should just call them spoiler alerts. The biggest difference between money and time is you always know how much money you have, but you never know how much time you have. And this is for the men out there. Don't let anyone ruin your day. Be a man, ruin it yourself. <laughs> and the best thing about being over 50 is we did all of our stupid stuff before the invention of the internet, so there's no proof. And the last thing, Telling your wife that you just cleared out some space in the freezer is much, sounds much more productive than I just ate all the ice cream. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, we're going to get one more opportunity to sing, so I'll have, go ahead and have you stand. We're going to sing, Jesus is Lord of All. seated.
always have very good songs. I really appreciate that this morning. I want me to take your Bibles this morning, if you would. We're going to go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 37. Psalm 37. You'll notice in the foyers a card. This is for WVGV, uh, West Virginia's Gospel Voice, and this week is the Spring share They just were able to purchase another station down in Rock Cave, and they're expanding here in West Virginia. I'll be down there tomorrow and uh, preaching on radio and working a shift there a couple times this week. So if you get a chance uh, to listen in, and if God would prompt your heart to help the radio station, uh, it is very, very good station. A lot of great preaching on it. Uh, very conservative, good gospel music. So uh, take advantage of that so you can grab a card if you'd like to do that. And then we mentioned about, of course, a sunrise service or Resurrection Sunday on the 17th, just three weeks away now. Uh, we have not done a sunrise service, I think, for two years, I believe, the last two years because of the pandemic. But we will do it this year. We'll meet here at 7 o'clock. And right after that, we're going to have breakfast together. So each month now we're going to try to do a meal together in the church. So for the month of April, that will be the meal. And so uh, my wife will be approaching some of the ladies about uh, making some casseroles and things like that for breakfast, as we've done in the past. And it's always a good time just being able to be here early on Sunday morning. So what we'll do is the sunrise service at 7, breakfast, and then our morning worship service on that day. So plan on that. And you'll notice in both foyers the posters for upcoming Missions Emphasis Month. Not a conference, but Missions Emphasis. And we start on Sunday, April 24th, uh, with a tremendous preacher of God's Word. Uh, he is a chaplain endorser with All Points Baptist Missions, Brother Mike Ferris, who has preached for us on different occasions. He is a powerful preacher, and he is a wonderful singer. He has a powerful voice. So I've asked him to sing a couple songs while he's here. And uh, you'll, you'll enjoy his ministry. And from that Sunday through about mid-May, we're going to have missionaries every Sunday. Uh, we have a missionary uh, to Bulgaria. The, uh, well, I'm going to forget their name, so I'm not going to try to say it. I'll mess it up, and then you'll, you'll tell them when they come. You say, he messed your name up really bad. But we'll have missionaries for those four consecutive Sundays. Always look forward to having uh, Bruce Burkholder here. It's actually Dr. Bruce Burkholder. It's an earned doctorate. Uh, God's given a brilliant mind served here as youth pastor. He went to Mexico City, served as a missionary for 10 years until his heart began to fail. And God has used him in translation work with biblical materials, uh, uh, theological materials, to get it in the hands of the Hispanic world to help uh, pastors and teachers just to grow the saints. There are lots and lots of people being saved throughout Central and South America. The floodgates are open there, and many, many are being saved. But many times, you know, they don't have the, the training that they would need necessarily to lead their people. So that's what he does with EBI. And he'll be here next Sunday. In fact, he'll be here the entire week. So looking forward to that. And I hope you'll be here next Sunday to hear Brother Bruce as he preaches for us. Lisa will be with him as well. Psalm 37 this morning. I'm going to read the first nine verses. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Father, use your word. I ask that you would fill me with the power of your spirit right now, that you would do a special work through this book that you said would never return void. I believe you, and I thank you for what you'll do in my own heart this morning and in every heart here. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes it's hard not to fret, 
But you'll find three times in this passage, God tells his people not to fret. Verse 1, fret not. Verse 7, fret not. Verse 8, fret not. I think God wants you to know we are not to fret, but sometimes it's hard not to fret, isn't it? When things seem so unfair at times, it's hard not to become incensed, and that's really what the word fret means. It means to become incensed at something or someone. Listen, to be very displeased. And so we think back over these last few years what's gone on in our society. I think out in California with Governor Gavin Newsom, he orders millions of Californians. I don't know what they're up to now, 11 million, 12 million, 15 million, whatever the population is there now. Everybody has to lock down, you have to mask up, you can't go to work, you can't do this, you can't do that, and yet he has a little private party with several of his closest friends, and he doesn't mask up, and he doesn't social distance, and someone just happened to have a cell phone and they videoed it. He tells his people what they can and cannot do, but he is not willing to abide by the same. Governor Whitman, or Whitmer in Michigan, locked down her citizens, shut down businesses, cost people their livelihoods, and yet her husband can get his speedboat and go to a lake in Michigan and have a good old time while everybody else has to stay in their homes. Those things incense you. Those things frustrate, they displease us. We've watched our federal government over these last few years devastate our country financially. There are businesses that have shut down that will never reopen. They've devastated people's lives through their edicts. And yet House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, after helping shut down small businesses, goes back to San Francisco and calls a small business owner who happens to have a hair salon to come out and have her own private hairdressing. It infuriates people. There's been a lot of things that have fretted us over the last few years. You could go to prison for insider trading. Most of you understand that term. And yet in Washington, both Republicans and Democrats in Congress will learn of companies that are about to lose everything, or they hear about a company that is about to have great benefit, and they know when the stocks will fall and when the stocks will rise because they sit in these committee meetings and they find out information, insider information, as it would be referred to you and me, and they'll make millions, millions. But if Jeff Sims were to do that, he'd go to a federal prison. If Harold McRae were to do that, he'd go to prison, but not those in Washington. Iniquities abound, and we get frustrated and we fret because of these iniquities. There's a word that has grown in our culture, and it is misapplied and given the wrong definition, and the word is equity. That is a, that is a terrible word as it's used in our culture today. That's a terrible word. But the word itself in its pure form simply means to be fair and to be just. Nothing in our society seems very fair or just, does it? In fact, there's a lot of inequity. David wrote this particular psalm. Another man, a Levite by the name of Asaph, wrote the 73rd psalm. And I want you to turn to Psalm 73. And you'll see what fretting is. Psalm 73. It's a tremendously helpful psalm. It's been a helpful psalm to me over the years. I hope it is to you. Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw, notice this, the prosperity of the wicked. Now think back to Psalm 37. Verse 1, fret not thyself because of evildoers to those workers in iniquity. Don't be envious of those people. And here Asaph says, why? Because they're prospering. You may not, but they will, and they are. Verse 4, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. 
Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt, and we've used that term several times for Washington, D.C. It's a corrupt place. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. A water, waters of a full cup are wrung out. There's an attitude of judgment here in this verse, in a sense that for the for the believer, for the child of Israel, or for the child of God today, that we get the raw end of the deal, so to speak while the wicked prosper. Go back to Psalm 37. The first thing out of God's mouth, fret not. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. This is God's command, not a suggestion. God says to you, God says to me, don't fret don't become incensed. Don't become frustrated over the workers of iniquity, over the evildoers who are prospering in their way. Now listen, they are evildoers and they will continue to do evil. I've been to Washington twice with Capital Connection. John's been with me. Harold's been with me. Uh, Chris has been with me. We go there in March. We enter into every single office of every senator and every representative across the United States. Now, it's not just us. I mean, there's a slew of independent Baptist pastors that go and we cover those offices for a number of days. We go in. In fact, there's actually been some staff saved through that effort. But I've come to know that there's a spirit in Washington. There's an evil spirit that is dominating the United States. And all you have to do is start reading the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and on through the minor prophets. And God says, when my, when my people begin to forsake me, and because this nation gave itself to God in its beginnings, even though we are now a secular nation, not a Christian nation, because we did moor ourselves to Jesus Christ, there is judgment that has befallen this nation, and we are under a demonic power in this nation. I am convinced of it, and you could not convince me otherwise. Amen. And so we go to Washington, and we try to convince these people, you know, to do righteously, and they'll nod there in agreement, mm -hmm. and they're still doing their evil, and nothing has changed, or so it seems. They're evildoers, and they will continue to do evil. They are working iniquity, and they will continue to do their evil works of iniquity. I pray for President Biden, I pray for Vice President Harris, I pray for Joe Manchin and Shelley Moore Capito and David McKinley and Alex Mooney and Evan Jenkins, I pray for Governor Justice, I pray for these people by name, and I'll continue to do it because it's right. And I pray for their salvation. I pray that God, despite them, will work his will, even if that means judgment for the United States. But there's an evil that will continue what does God say? Don't fret. Now notice what God does not say here. He does not say, you can stop fretting now because the evildoer has stopped doing his evil. And the workers of iniquity have stopped doing their iniquitous ways. No, that's not what he said. He said they're doing iniquitous things. They're evildoers, but don't fret anyway. They're going to continue. But that's my realm. That's my business. Don't fret because of evildoers, because of the workers of iniquity. They'll continue in their sin, but don't fret. Now why? Look at verse 2. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. They shall soon be cut down. You say, when is soon? Well, I don't know exactly when, but I do know this. A thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So he get around to it when he's good and ready. You don't rush God, and I can't rush God. Sometimes I try, but I can't. He said they will soon be cut down. 
Now, you don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 73, the 16th verse, Asaph said this, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. When I thought to know the prosperity of the wicked, when I thought to know of all the ways that they are blessed, and here I am serving God, and I suffer. And quite frankly, that's the way sometimes we feel. And as we watch things continue to escalate in our, our, every aspect of our current life here in the United States, sometimes we feel that way. He said, when I thought about this, it was too painful for me until I went in to the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. See, here's my problem, and here may be your problem, and I'm not sure, but this might be your problem. When we fret, it's this. We're not really going into the sanctuary of the Lord like we should. Now, this is a type of a sanctuary. I call this a house of God. It is. It's a place where the saints, where this local family of believers gathers to be challenged in God's word, to have fellowship with each other. Listen, you can't get a whole lot of fellowship out there but you should be able to get some fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul was right. Yesterday, it was miserable out there you know, for several hours, but we're laughing and cutting up and carrying on and just having a good time. I don't think the guys on Friday laughed at all. I couldn't hear Vern Underwood say a thing. I just think he was just, I guess they had no fun on Friday, but we, the fun crew was out there yesterday. Now listen, you can get with Christians, whether it's in a, in a slime pit like yesterday or whether it is in a church service like this, and there's real fellowship here. The ladies went on the prayer advance. I don't know what happened. They had, a, they had a great time. Not just through the preaching of God's word. They had a great time in fellowship with one another. The sanctuary provides that. And I believe that God speaks about the sanctuary in a sense because Asaph, that's what he did. That's what his life was. He was in the temple every single day of his life. He served in the temple. He's kind of a big shot among the Levites. But I believe it's more than this sanctuary. I, I believe it's a sanctuary in a sense of our own heart, the temple that God has placed in us, where you can go each day, even if you're not with the brethren, and go into God's word, that secret place of the Most High, where you can go and God begin to open your eyes. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And as you begin to spend time in this book, listen, God begins to open your heart and mind. I think Asaph referred to that sanctuary of the temple, but I also believe that he refers to the sanctuary that you have by just getting alone with God. I know I've been emphasizing this a lot, getting alone with God, finding the secret place, because, brother, if ever you needed it, it is now. If ever you needed it, it is now. The sanctuary. He said, they'll soon be cut down. And Asaph said, then understood I their end. When I understood God's perspective, then I understood their end. And I could quit fretting. His name is Jeffrey Epstein. Everybody knows that name. Very infamous name now. A billionaire. Probably many times over. Has a palatial townhouse or had a palatial townhouse in New York City, $88 million. $88 million for that townhouse. Now, I was thinking about this the other day. My daughter Chelsea and her husband Juan, they live in a townhouse. And Jeff Grepstein lives in a townhouse. But they ain't quite the same. Not quite the same. I think, I think Chelsea and Juan's townhouse is a couple million dollars less. Now, listen, this man is filthy rich. And that term filthy is, is very appropriate. He owned his own private island. Of course, everybody's heard of it there in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He had a little island called Little St. James that he purchased, 70 plus acres. And he brought a lot of clients down, including men like Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew of Great Britain. Epstein lived a very luxurious life, but he also lived a very debauched life, a very wicked and perverse life that was soon discovered. I didn't know this, I was reading about him the other day, and of course, many small islands in that chain of islands, and islands around Little St. James began to refer to Epstein Island as Pedophile Island. 
or island of sin. People knew what was going on. Uh, you know the, the horrors that went on there. So I, I don't need to rehearse those things to you. And he lived for years. He made it to 66 years of age until God cut him off. Be sure your sin will find you out. And that seen sin found him out. And there in a jail cell in New York, guards walked away. Security cameras went down. Oh, what a surprise. And when the security cameras come back on and the guards come back, he is hung by the neck there in that jail cell in New York City. Who did it? I don't know. But I do know God allowed it. And he was soon cut off. Didn't seem for a long time like he would ever get his justice, but God saw to it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Let me just warn everybody here as American citizens, there is a fever growing within the hearts of our citizenry to take up arms possibly one day. And I don't know, maybe there will be a, uh, our Constitution does call for that when the government corrupts itself. But just be very careful and keep this in mind. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. It's not my job to render vengeance on anybody. Even when I'm done wrong or you're done wrong, it's not my place or your place to do vengeance. It's God's place. And God took vengeance on Jeffrey Epstein for all the evil things he's done. And by the way, I could start rattling off names and your blood pressure would start going up because you know the evil what these people have done. One day God will bring them to justice as well. So what does God say? Don't fret. Just don't fret. But God does say this. Don't fret. Instead, do something else. Verse 3. Instead of fretting, I want you to trust in the Lord. Now listen, while evildoers prosper, God tells us to trust. You're not going to stop the evildoer from doing evil. God will stop him. You won't stop him. God will. But while he prospers, God says, you just trust me. Now think about the word trust. What does it mean? It means to put your confidence in, to put your hope in someone. God says this, I just want you to put your confidence in me. Folks, our confidence cannot be in Washington, D.C., nor, nor in Charleston, West Virginia, nor in City Hall at Bridgeport. Tomorrow night I get the opportunity to go pray for the, uh, the uh, meeting there uh, with Governor um, Mayor Lang and city council members. That, that's, that's a privilege. I look forward to doing that. But my hope is not in City Hall. It's not in Charleston. It's not in Washington, D.C. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me, as the song said. We're to trust in him, put our confidence in him. I'm to trust that God, now listen, this is important that you understand this about trust. I trust that God will. He has not yet, but he will. When is God going to take care of all those crooks? In his good time. When it is right. And by the way, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And is long-suffering to us, to us word, not willing what? That any should perish. He does not want Nancy Pelosi to go to hell. He does not want Gavin Newsom to go to hell. He wants those people to be saved. You and I should be praying for the salvation of those who lead this nation, no matter how corrupt they may be. He wants them to be saved. So trust is this. I trust that God will, although he has not yet. But he will. Do you believe that? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And what? Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Lean not to thine own understanding. Listen, I have a sense, of what I think is an understanding of what's going on. And listen, I'm like every other guy. I stand around and talk about what I think are solutions to this uh, quagmire that we have ourselves here in the United States. I do it. Maybe you do it too. But the reality is, only God can do a work. The reality is, my focus is to be simply on trusting him, that he will. He hasn't yet, but he will. That's why God calls us to trust, because things have not yet been fulfilled. 
And then he says in that verse, trust in the Lord and do good. While we are trusting the Lord and waiting for him to do a work among the evildoers and the workers of iniquity, this is what he said. Now listen, this is what he said. Do good. Do good. In Ephesians chapter 2, you know, verses 8 and 9, you quote them, I quote them about being saved by grace. But then verse 10, he says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. You, re- you know when God saved you, he didn't call you to sit in a pew. He called you to work, to do good works. What did you do this week to serve Jesus Christ? What did you do to please him? And I'm not talking necessarily about teaching in Awanas or digging a ditch outside on a Saturday or a Friday. I'm not necessarily talking about everything that happens here. But what did you do even in your neighborhood? What did you do at work? What did you do among your family? What did you do among the strangers in areas of good works? What did you do? God says, I want you to trust me. And while you're trusting, I want you to do good. Don't sit around and twiddle your thumbs. The one thing is we believe that Jesus Christ is soon to return is to obey what Jesus said, occupy till I come. Don't sit around and doing this. Well, I think he's coming back, so why even start? No, he said, occupy. In other words, get busy and work. Work for the night cometh when no man can work. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, Paul said, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. God wants you and me to abound in good works. It's said of Jesus' life in Acts 10, 38, that Jesus went about doing good. Did he preach the gospel? Absolutely. But you know what he did? In between preaching, he blessed little children, he fed hungry people, he healed the sick, he comforted those who were broken, he went about doing good. What does God want Jeff Vaughn to do? He wants him to go about and doing good. What does God want you to do? He wants you to go about doing good. Trust in the Lord and do good. And you notice the last half of the verse, it says, So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Right now, we're going through food shortages. Ladies, you know this very well. I think mostly it's ladies and families that go to the grocery store. And I hear it from my wife. You know, there was nothing. You know, can't find this, can't find that. And what the experts are saying is going to get worse before it gets better. God said, if you'll trust me, and not sit around wring your hands or twiddle your thumbs, and you'll do good. Get busy for me. He said, I'll take care of you. You believe that? You believe God will take care of you, that thou shalt be fed? He said he would. He said, don't fret. Trust in the Lord and do good. And then verse 4, he says, something else I want you to do. I want you to delight yourself in the Lord. This is what I want you to do. Yes, I want you to trust in me, but go beyond this and delight in me. When you start a relationship, whether it's a friendship or whether it's potential for marriage, every relationship has to be built on trust. Otherwise, there's not going to be a friendship. Whether it's husband, wife, whether it's just best friends, whatever, you know, a a partnership in a business, which I don't necessarily recommend, but if you do have that, you've got to have trust. But let's say it's between you and, a, and a, an acquaintance, and all of a sudden you, you learn to trust this man or this woman, and as you spend more time because you, you can trust them, something happens. You take interest in the things that they are interested in. You learn, if you will, as he says here, to delight in that person. The word delight means just that. You just take delight in the person. You, you take pleasure in them. And normally that's what happens. I, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I've said this before, so I don't think it'll be offensive for me to say it again. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a people person. I'm more introverted in my nature, and I could do just fine, thank you, isolating myself. That's just the way I am. Not a lot of folks are like that. Not everybody, but some are like that. 
And it was, there was a push the first 11 years of my ministry down at Belmont Baptist, our pastor there, Pastor Jackson, kind of had to push me to reach out to people. Jeff, you can't, you can't be in ministry and do this. You've got to reach out to people. You've got to get to know people. You've got to spend time with people. And it was like pulling teeth sometimes. But you know what I found? When there was someone I didn't know, I was always hesitant to get to know them. I just I really didn't want to get to know them. I just, not that way. But when I would start to spend a little bit of time I'd start to like them. Amazing. You spend time with people, you can actually begin to like them. Now, I'm going to be honest, there are some people I didn't think I would like because I realized they didn't like the things that I like. I'm a huge sports fan. You want to know something about sports? You can ask me. I probably know. I just love sports. I'm not saying that's good. I just, that's one of the things I like. We got guys in here who are big time hunters. You can ask them about a rifle and they can tell you everything about rifles. They can tell you everything about, you know, ammunition. They can tell you everything about how to hunt a deer, how to hunt a duck, how to hunt this, how to hunt that. Ask Jeff Sims. He knows it all. So just ask him. He, he loves that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, you, you begin to spend some time with someone that you think you'd have no, no common ground on or no interest. And all of a sudden, you realize, well, there are a few things that we think about. There are some things we're similar in. And all of a sudden, you begin to delight in that person. And it's more than just, well, I can trust that person. If I ask him to take this thing over there to that house, he would do it for me. I can trust him. We're, we're good acquaintances. Now it's like, I, I really like this person. And I'd like to do things that will make this person happy. See, God says, first thing I want you to do is just trust me. That's what happens at the moment of salvation. You come to trust him. Oh, let's be honest. Salvation is only the start. It's the point of trust. It's not the point of delight. Oh, you may be happy that you're not going to hell. You may be happy that you got a home in heaven. And you may be glad that Jesus died for you, but let's be honest. You don't love him at the moment of salvation like you're going to love him 20 years down the road. Is that not true, folks? That's true. But then you begin to spend time with him. And you're grateful to him. And you can trust him. But then you get to understand him. And the more you understand the Lord Jesus, the more you want to please him. The more you want to please him. God says this. This is what I want you to do. I want you to trust me. But I don't want it to end there. I want you to learn to begin to delight in me. Delight thyself also not in your circumstances, because your circumstances will cause you to fret. Delight in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life may feel like it's in shambles, but you can still delight this morning. You may not be able to delight in your health. You may not be able to delight in, you know, your workstation in life because you don't know if you're going to have that job this time next year. Your home may feel like it's falling apart. There are things you may not be able to delight in, but at any moment, at any time, you can delight in the Lord himself, in the person of Jesus Christ. And then notice what he says. If you'll delight in me, he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. So when I got saved, I would read that verse and be like, hot dog. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask him for a Lamborghini. I'm going to ask him for a mansion. I'm going to ask him for big things. You know, God's never given me a Lamborghini. Well, I do take that back. I do have Lamborghini. It's about yay big. I told you about that. My kids gave it to me for Christmas a couple years ago, kind of as a gag gift. I got, so I got my Lamborghini. It says on my dresser under my house. But, you know, I've never gotten a Lamborghini. I've never had a mansion. You say, well, then God didn't give you the desires of your heart. Oh, no, no, no. God has given me the desires of my heart. Because you know what happened? When I began to learn to delight myself in Jesus Christ, the things that delight him have begun to delight me. And the things that he desires are now the things that I desire. I could care less about a Lamborghini. I could care less about a mansion. But I do have desires I have a desire that when I stand before him, I'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. I desire that when I 
reach heaven and I stand before him in judgment, I can say, these are the people I brought to you that you saved, but that I led to you. I have a desire to be able to see my life end one day and know that my children have gone after him. God has given me the desires of my heart. Delight yourself. Don't fret. Trust in the Lord and do good and delight yourself in him. And then he says, let's not stop there. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Now you begin to trust. Now you begin to delight in him. And God says, now, this is what I want you to do. Next step. Commit your ways to me. What does that mean? The word commit means to put into the hand of another, to take what you possess, what you are, and place it into somebody else's hands. You're, you're entrusting that person. There's a song that a lady back in my home church used to sing, and she's singing on occasion. She had a great voice, and the song said, Here's my heart. I lay it on the altar. God, I'm, I'm committing everything to you. I'm entrusting everything to you. So now God asks us to go that step further and commit or put into his hands our way. Notice that. Commit thy way, singular, unto the Lord. Commit thy way. It's interesting. Who is Jesus? He is the way. John 14, 6. He's the way. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Now, Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, here's, here's a struggle for you and me as Christians. We have a way, and often we think it's, it's going to be the right way. And God says, no, I want you to take the way and commit it to me, put it in my hands, and you have hands off. And we say, I don't, no, that's risky. No, I, I've already figured out in my mind, this is what I'm going to do for my career. This is where I'm going to go for my education. This is the person I'm going to marry. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. Commit thy way unto the Lord because, again, Proverbs 16, verse 25, there's a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You commit your way to me. We sing the, the invitation to him, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am tender, yielded and still. How many times have we sung that and we walk out the door and we just do what we want? We have our own way. God says, if you will, quit fretting over everything. Start to trust me. Do good. Commit your way to me. And you'll see things change. It's an interesting account there in Acts 27 when Paul is on a prisoner ship headed to Rome to stand before Caesar Long story short, they run into a massive storm called a Eurachlodon. They are near death. They've been at sea. That ship has been tossed to and fro, and they have now cast anchors, and they've somehow stabilized a ship near an island. When everybody thought they were all going to die, God sent an angel to tell Paul, no, every single man, all 300 and some people that were aboard that ship, would live. Now, no one had believed Paul when he said, don't sell. Well, you'll run into trouble. It'll, it'll endanger our lives. They say, you're not a sailor. You don't know what you're talking about. And then they realize, you know what, this guy might be right. So when he said, an angel of the Lord said we'd all be spared, they said, might as well trust him. Might as well believe what he says. And make a long story short, God did have them survive. But an interesting verse in Acts 27, verse 40, it says, And when they had taken up anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. In other words, we don't know where this is going to lead us. We don't know what's going to happen. But now we have absolutely no control. It's all in the hands of God. You know what God says to you? I don't want you to have control. I want control. Commit your way to me. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Now notice the reaffirmation of trust. Trust also in him. Because when you do let go, that's a huge step in life. You've got to reaffirm your trust in him that though he hasn't, he will. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also 
in him. Now notice this, and he shall, this is a given, he shall bring it to pass. You say, bring what to pass? I don't know. I've committed my ways to him. I don't know exactly how he's going to lead, but I do believe he will. I do believe if I will simply trust him and try to learn to delight myself in him and commit my way to him, take hands off, that he has enough sense to put me where I need to be in my education, in matrimony, in raising children, in my career, in every aspect of my life. He can do that. He will bring it to pass. And then notice one other thing he says here. I don't want you to fret over evildoers or the workers of iniquity. Oh, they abound, and they're going to continue in their way. But while they are continuing, trust me that I will take care of this, and you just do good. You delight in me, and you commit your way to me. In verse 7, then you rest in me. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The word rest means exactly that, rest. It means to quiet yourself. God, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to fear. Now, I know that's easier to, to say than to do. But that's why you begin to develop trust. And that's why you have to get to the point where you're willing to take hands off and commit your way to him. And then he said, when you come to that point, you can just rest in him. You see, rest is the ultimate level of faith. It is the peak of and we could even say the climate of faith. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. You need to look at this, so take your Bible and turn with me. Hebrews chapter 3. And I want you to look beginning in verse 8. The writer, whether it was Apostle Paul or Timothy or whoever wrote this book, when they wrote this book, they were dealing with Jewish people who had converted to Jesus Christ. But now these people were being bombarded with the, with the thought process, you have to return to the law. You have to turn, return to the Jewish ritual because Christ is not enough. Christ is not enough. And so he deals within the first chapter about the authority and the power and the deity of Jesus Christ. He is God. And then when you come to chapter 2, he begins to deal with them about what Jesus did to humble himself and give his life for them. And you get to chapter 3, and he begins to deal with a thing called rest. And he uses the example of the Jewish people of years ago through the wilderness, how they provoked God and did not obey him and did not do those things that were right simply because they really didn't believe him. They really didn't believe him. And even they were, though they had seen all these marvelous works in Egypt and saw the marvelous works at the Red Sea and saw the marvelous works through wilderness, they still struggled to believe him, did not walk by faith. And so we come to chapter 3, verse 8, and the warning here is given to these believers. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. Remember, in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You can't lose the Holy Spirit, but brother, you and I can sure grieve him. And we can grieve God. And that's what he says there. I was grieved with that generation. and said, They do all we err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Notice that. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Some people equate this to these people never having truly been saved. These people were never truly the children of God. Now, that's a theological debate that we could have at another time. Where were they headed? They were headed to Canaan, to the promised land. What happened in the promised land? They faced temptations, they sinned, they had to war and fight. Now listen, when you get into heaven, you don't fight, and you don't face temptation, and you don't sin. The promised land is not a picture of heaven. The promised land for the Jew was a picture to the Christians of a victorious Christian life. 
And God says, this is my, my goal for Jeff Vaughn. This is my goal for Joan Nicewarner. This is my goal for Levi. This is my goal for you, that you live before you get to heaven, where you're free from temptation and free from sin before you get there, that while you're living in the sin-cursed earth, you can have a victorious life in me. But in order to do that, you've got to learn the ultimate level of faith, and that is just simply resting in me. Resting in me. In chapter 4, verse 9, the writer says this, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There's a rest. Now let me give you an example of people resting. You're resting right now. You walked into this auditorium today, and you walked up to the pew you're sitting in, and this is what you did not do. You didn't, you didn't cautiously, oh, I sure hope this doesn't collapse. You know what you did? And I watched some of you, you just plop yourself right down. If you're like me, you're big, still plop yourself right down. Or you may be really tiny and, and, and thin, and you just plopped yourself down. You know what you did? You had no question in your heart or your mind that that pew that was made by man would hold you up. There are literally tons of weight above your head. Tons of weight above your head. Put there by men. None of you sit in the service doing this. I sure hope that ceiling stays up there today. I sure hope those trusts don't fall down and crush me because they could. That just happened. In fact, that's happened a couple times. That apartment building down at Miami Beach and recently another building collapsed, taking a lot of lives. You know what? It could happen. But I've never seen, in all my years here, I've never seen anybody come in with that kind of caution or panic. You know why? Because you trust. You just come and sit down. You don't think a thing about it. And you wouldn't think a thing about it unless I had said something to you. Now you're probably all panicking. So. But, but the reality is this. That's what, that's what the ultimate level of faith is, where you just say, God's got it. It's not a big deal. I can trust him. He'll take care of this. Do you believe that? Do you believe God will take care of you while the evildoers prosper in Washington? Do you believe that he can feed you when there are food shortages? And costs are going through the roof for everyday items, whether from heating your home to putting fuel in your vehicle. And by the way, not to be discouraging, but they say we're in a law right now and things are going to get much worse. You say you're a doomsdayer. No, I'm just being a realist. And I keep my eye on what's going on. I know a lot of people don't. I do. No profit, but you don't have to be a, a, a brain surgeon to figure out the way our country is headed. And the stupid, yeah, I know, I shouldn't have said stupid, but I will anyway, the stupid decisions that our leaders are making. I believe there is an evil spirit that is controlling Washington that is leading them to these kind of decisions because God has the design to bring this world to an end. And he said, in the meantime, quit fretting over it. Just trust me and do good. Just delight in me. Just commit your way to me. And ultimately, I want you to get to the, the decision where you just rest in me. God, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're in control. You've got everything under control. I'm not worried about what's going to be on my table tomorrow. And by the way, again, Matthew chapter 6, give us this day daily. Daily bread. Daily bread. At the end of this passage, at the end of verse 7, he says, Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. If we're honest, it seems like everything that's being done in the political realm is a wicked device, stymieing their own people. Not just here, but in Canada and in France and in Great Britain, Germany, you name it. And there's a purpose and a reason for it. And God knows full well what's going on, and he is in control. Verse 8, cease from anger. How many times have you, have you watched the evening news and you just start screaming at the TV? And your wife runs in, what are you, what are you doing? 
most people, and you haven't solved a thing, and I haven't solved a thing. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Let's grab a rifle. Let's march on Washington. You know, listen, those things are being bantied about. Verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. They'll inherit the earth. Now, for the Jews of this day, of course, David is king. And for the first time, the fulfillment of what God promised the Jews is coming to pass. They are now the dominant nation. They are now prospering. And that would even become more so. There was a picture of the millennial kingdom during the reign of Saul. There was peace. Saul had few enemies, or Solomon had few enemies. Everybody was almost stinking rich in Israel. They had everything their hearts could desire. There was a picture of the millennial kingdom. God promised the Jews that, a physical kingdom. But let me remind you of what we're told in the book of John, chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus looked and said, my kingdom is not of this world. Quit looking for a kingdom to be set up here. Now the, now the Jehovah Witnesses are looking for a kingdom to be set up. Only 144,000 go into heaven itself. The rest of the people will be in a paradise on earth. Now listen, they got their theology mixed up. There will be a millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ. We will come back and rule and reign with him. But I'm not looking to inherit the earth. I've got a mansion in heaven. And that's where I'm going. Now I'll get to come back and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But my home is with him in his city. And the point is this. He said, I'll cause you to inherit. I'll cause you to be blessed if you'll just keep trusting me, if you'll just keep doing good, if you just commit your ways to me, if you will just continue to commit your way to me and just rest in me. And three times in that passage, don't fret. Don't fret. Don't fret. I'm just going to choose to believe God. I'm just going to believe him. And whatever happens in the months and in these years to come, if he doesn't come back, I'll just trust him. If I have to suffer a little bit before his coming, I realize what I have waiting for me in eternity. And that'll be okay. I want to encourage you, God's people, to have this kind of a heart in the midst of a world that is corrupt and wicked. God has it. God has it under control. Inspire heads for prayer. It is easy to fret. And I'd be a liar if I stood here in this pulpit and said, I never fret. That would not be true. There are times I have to go back before the Lord and say, will you forgive me for fretting? But I'm going to take God's admonition to believe him to trust him, to rest in him. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Maybe this morning you say, Pastor Vaughn, I'm not really trusting him like I should. I am fretting. Well, maybe you need to come to the altar and just get that right with him this morning. Maybe this morning you need to recommit your way to him. Maybe you need to learn just to rest in him. God will work as you ask him to do so. Father, take what we have heard in your word, and I pray you'd use it for your good. God, that we would truly learn to, to trust you, to rest in you, commit our ways to you, delight in you. We'll thank you for what you will do in Jesus' name. We'll stand with our heads bowed. I'm going to have Patty begin to play. If you need to come this morning, I encourage you to do that right now.
That song's kind of appropriate after what we just preached. I, I don't know if I'll remember the words like I should, but it, we'll just try to sing that first verse from memory. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would drift in like a ship without a Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, with can't do a single thing without him. You can't survive the storm that's been here and going to brew even further without him. Keep that in mind. We're so glad today to have Titus and Caroline coming to join us in membership here at Grace. And a few weeks ago, uh, we went out for lunch together and uh, didn't know much about Caroline. She and Titus have been attending now for a little while, been in our uh, new, uh, new Beginnings class, of course, here in main service. So just wanted to find out about her and uh, found out uh, that she got saved about a year ago. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Now, for those ladies just came back from the prayer events, uh, the name of uh, Terry St. John and his wife, they're heavily involved with the, the prayer advances. And that's Titus's uncle and aunt. And uh, he was up here visiting, and uh, Brother St. John led Caroline to the Lord and just really, really enjoyed hearing her testimony. And so Caroline expressed to me a desire to be baptized. So she is coming to join the church, of course, upon the basis of her following the Lord and believers' baptism. And so that will take place here soon. But we're sure glad to have you guys come. So I'll have you stand for just a second. And I'm just going to ask, Titus, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And do you desire to come here and serve the Lord through this ministry? And Caroline, do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? And would you like to serve the Lord here as well? Okay. Well, we're glad to have them come. And if you would like to see Titus and Caroline both become members of this church, let it just be known by an amen. 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 Well, even if there was any negatives, there's too many amens, to, <laughs> so we only ask that. But uh, I know you're filling those, those forms out for us, but I'm just going to have you stay right up here at the pew. And if you'd like to come by and just welcome Titus and Caroline into the fellowship of our church, you're welcome to do that. You know, it, it's always good to see people come and uh, join in with us. You know, there's limitations for people that aren't members. There are certain things that people cannot do. And, uh, of course, that's natural with any church. So if you're not a member, you'd like to become a member, make sure you see me, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that. So let's go ahead, and uh, I'll make my way to the back, and I'm going to have Brother Harold why don't you lift up your voice and close us in prayer, please?